about um, the Endangered Archaeology Project, which has been running for about a year. Um, we're a two-year project um, aiming to record or we'll make a big database recording archaeological sites in the Middle East and North Africa. We're not just recording the locations of sites and sort of what they are, we're also recording how they might have already been damaged, how they might be at risk of further damage or even if they've been destroyed. So I've got this example of an early Islamic palace at the site of Raqqa, unfortunately now well known for the wrong reasons. You can see it here. Then the modern imagery, it's been completely destroyed. Um, <clears throat> so we're all quite familiar with seeing, unfortunately, we're seeing images like this um, in the news, um, stuff like this. That's what it looked like before. Um, what we perhaps hear less of, um, what, or what's perhaps less high profile, is the sort of damage to archaeology in the Middle region through things like um, agricultural expansion, um, so some building of field systems here. Um, that's what it looks like from above. Um, and from things like urban expansion as well. Um, so what Amina is aiming to do is to record um, all types of archaeology, and not just the sort of well-known monumental sites, and also um, all types of damage and destruction, and to try and identify what what's sort of having the biggest impact on archaeology. So our methodology is sort of primarily um, image interpretation. Um, we're using a thing like Google Earth, but also using um, aerial historical aerial photos, more recent aerial photos. Um, historical satellite imagery such as Corona, KH7, that sort of thing. Uh, also more recent satellite imagery. Um, um, our database is also designed so that we can bring in data from existing surveys and excavations and that we can continue to input data from sort of new, new surveys and things like that. Um, so the sort of primary methodology involves looking at Google Earth, finding a site, um, marking its location and marking a few things about that site that we can observe purely from looking at the imagery. Um, but then where we can, for more specific areas, sort of case studies, we're bringing in um, extra information as well. And as I say, the database is designed so that um, more stuff can be added in. Um, so obviously um, there's some things to think about when using this image interpretation methodology. Um, probably some of you are already thinking, oh, you know, you can't see everything. What if you only have sort of rubbish imagery? I mean, you, you might end up with something like that, so that's pretty useless. Um, you make something like that. Um, you also have to think about the sort of time of day the image is taken, the sort of properties of the image as well, and, and how that affects what you can map and what you can see. Um, so it's also useful to get um, a range of imagery across different times. So here we've got um, aerial photograph from 1949 through to a 2015 Worldview 3 image. And um, we can use sort of this range of imagery to look at how a site might have changed, um, how it might have been damaged, cleaned by archaeologists or by people planting trees and that sort of thing, um, which is what's happened here. Um, and so um, pro one problem with using something like Google Earth too much is, I mean, the coverage isn't sort of perfect. We haven't got good imagery for sort of every location we want to map, so we, we are sort of buying some additional imagery sometimes as well. But I'm going to talk about a few case studies today, mainly from um, Al Jufra and Libya, from Cyrene and Libya, and also from, um, if you get too close to that, it looks really weird. So maybe you can see that a draw in Morocco. Um, so in terms of Al Jufra and Libya, um, these are sort of oasis towns um, with lots of interesting archaeology around them. Um, so these are some, some distance from the sort of um, perhaps more well-known monumental sites, but they're equally important to the archaeology of Libya. So um, we can use things like the Worldview 2 imagery to um, really map these in some detail so we can really see the sort of detailed layout of an individual site. Um, we can also see where things like modern field boundaries are starting to impact on the preservation of the archaeology. Um, but one thing we were interested in this area was um, you know, what the impact of the um, agricultural expansion really is in this area, because this has really increased since the 1970s. Um, so we look at some vegetation indexes just using freely available landfill imagery. So maybe you can see um, these blue lines are some foggers, which are underground uh, water management channels. In the, the difference between the 1970s image and the um, 2014 Landsat image, um, the sort of cultivated area has really increased. And in fact, that's, um, in the sort of area we've defined as Al Jufra, that's increased by over 5,000 hectares since the 1970s. I hope you can really see that land of vegetation index. There's not that much going on in the 1970s, but by 2011, there's quite extensive cultivation with colourful areas that are cultivated areas. And perhaps you can also see um, the layouts of new field boundaries that will even further impact on the archaeology that's there. Um, so we've talked about the um, impact of agriculture on archaeology. We also want to look at urban expansion. So that's another big cause of damage and destruction to archaeology. Um, so, it's, for example, the town of Old Sukhna, also in Al Jufra, um, what a 1930s era photograph, you can really nicely see the layout of that site. Um, but by um, the more modern image, you can see it's been destroyed. We know from people that visited there that it was sometime between 
um, the 19, um, 19, early 1970s and about 1998 um, that that was destroyed. Um, all that sort of really remains, I should have some sort of point here, is that thing there, which is that thing there. Which is the mouse. Yeah, it's a bit, I don't know. Well, anyway, um, so this kind of um, destruction through urbanism. I mean, we're using quite a lot of these historical era photographs. So we've got the Libyan Studies Archive here in Leicester with boxes and boxes of good photographs to use. Um, it can be a bit challenging to use these because someone threw away or, or the warehouse burnt down that had the bit of paper in that told us all about the, the altitude of the plane and that sort of thing. We're lucky we have half an altimeter on some of these and the scale and stuff like that so we can start to reconstruct these. Um, we want to make um, accurate ortho photos so that it can, they can be used for field work and I'll come on to more of that in a bit. Um, we've also got some of the declassified um, um, Cold War spy satellite imagery. So, for example, one of the ones we're using for Libya is, and um, we've got the Corona, but we're also using the KH7, which has proved to be very useful. It's also useful as a base map to map the earlier um, aerial photographs onto as well. Um, so, I mean, this data can be quite challenging to work with. We're probably lucky we've got any at all, because it was dropped from space. Some guys hung a big net out of the plane that flew around, and they sort of caught it in the net. But if that failed, there were always those guys there. So we're probably lucky. And there were some submarines underneath as well, um, just, just, you know, well, they weren't there for, for the same reasons, but well, maybe they were. Um, so we're lucky we have some of this. It is really useful. We can see a lot of archaeology from the 60s and 70s before it was really sort of destroyed. So back to Al Jufra, these are some, these are those foggers I mentioned earlier, where we can see these dark lines. We can see these in the corona images. Um, but um, unfortunately now these have almost entirely been destroyed. So um, sometimes the historical imagery, it is worth spending the time getting accurate camera models on these because it is the only way we can see the archaeology. Um, but we can also bring in the more recent satellite images, um, for example the World View 2, to look at what sites are not just destroyed but are at imminent risk of being destroyed. So this is another area of Fogras quite nearby, those other ones. Uh, so the blue lines are the fogrens, um, but maybe you can see there's some modern cultivation just to the north of that, but there's a, a huge layout of new field boundaries which overlay the, um, the fogrens, you can see those here. Um, presumably once those fields come into cultivation they'll probably be levelled and the features will be destroyed, so it's almost a sort of last sort of opportunity to, to record those using imagery. Um, so I'm going back to the site of Cyrene now, have I already mentioned it? Maybe I haven't, I can't remember. Um, so um, this is where we're bringing in a sort of aerial photographs from the Libya Studies Archive um, to really see how that site has changed since the 1940s and to see what sort of what's had the biggest impact on that site. Um, so the red, uh, we haven't, um, I haven't also rectified all the images yet for the few maps, um, but the red um, areas are things like rock cut tombs, um, roadways, all kinds of archaeology around that site, really important archaeology. Um, so when we look at the uh, KH7 image, we can see that that area is still sort of, um, it's relatively well preserved, there's not sort of too much modern activity impacting on, on those. But when we look at the 2015 World V3 image, um, this is a town of modern town of Shahat here, sort of aspects of that town are, are really impacting on this archaeology. New rows are built, new buildings are being built as we speak, um, and really this is having a big Im impact on the survival of all, all that archaeology. And I'll come on to that a bit more um, later on. Um, so we need to think a bit critically about how we're um, using image interpretation as a primary methodology. It can't really replace field work, um, but um, in some ways it allows us to be a bit more objective. We're not just looking at the really big monumental sites. Uh, we can look at all types of archaeology and all types of landscapes. We don't have to be like these sort of guys in the hats just sort of going for the, their sort of whatever they're doing there. Um, I mean, we have to make decisions about what do we record? I mean, do we record um, everything? Um, so there's lots of archaeological features here. There's a sort of a town, there's roads, there's bulldozing, the, there's dumping up there as well that are sort of affecting the site. You know, do we do it digitise every, every feature, every point, or do we just sort of nominate huge areas as archaeological? Um, you know, how much time are we going to spend doing that and how valuable um, is sort of just saying, right, don't build there, that sort of thing. Um, so what, are we actually, what is this actual database? So we're using the Arches platform, which is open source, and eventually this will be um, freely available online. We're sort of having sort of two levels of that, so people with an account can log in and see more details about the sites, but people without will, will still be able to sort of see some aspects of it. Um, so, for example, an example we might have this town of, of Hun also in Al Jufra. Um, we can map this from the aerial photos and the satellite imagery from Google Earth. 
um, and then we can start to record information, I mean, about our interpretations, what type of site it is, um, even just sort of stuff about what the shape of the site is, what any names it has, its location. And we can also start to record things um, about how it might have been damaged so, and when we think that's happened, what the consequences of that of that was. So here we've, we've stated it was a loss of archaeological material and it's development of modern construction that's affected it. Um, so it might end up looking a bit like this as an example from Morocco. So what are we actually going to do with this? Um, so our intention is it can be used for research. It will be made available to archaeologists working throughout the MENA region and is increasingly being made available. Um, it could be used to think about planning decisions. Um, it could also be it can also be used as um, a sort of monuments record and things as well, and a good sort of storage place for for archaeological data. Um, so we've already started to use it in this way. Um, so, for example, for the site of Cyrene, we've got all these images where we've identified which areas um, are really at risk of being sort of damage and destruction. Um, and Nesta PhD student Mohammed, who is in the back there, um, went um, to Cyrene this summer and did some field work um, using some of these images to, to see sort of which areas were most at risk. Uh, and I sort of recorded, and he recorded things like um, bulldozing to rock tombs and things like that and um, how sort of modern buildings are really encroaching on the, the archaeology around the town of Shahat as well. Um, we, also, we did some field work in um, Morocco in November as part of the Middle Draw project at the University of Leicester. Um, and one of the things we did with our, our, our data from that field work was to not only record the sites, but also to record the damage and destruction that were impacting on the sites so we could put that into the AMENA database. Um, so from a sort of a, a look at the images, we could spot things like this um, nice quarry. There was a lot of quarrying going on, and that's destroyed some cairns here. Um, you can see it from top of that site there, and there was quite a lot of that sort of activity that's really been increasing the last few years. Um, also in sort of urbanism, things like dumping, um, agricultural expansion as well. So you can see this nice foggera here, really nice foggera, and there's a load of old rubbish in the middle. I still can't use that rucksack. Um, there were so many dead dogs, dead camels, dead donkeys that I sort of feel I, you know, I, I need to wash that rucksack really well. Um, it was pretty bad, and there were sort of big pits dug in, in the tunnel. Um, I, mean, I don't know if Katrina is in here, but she was there for scale for that. You can see the fogger kind of in the the fogger shaft in the corner there. Um, and then just digging huge pits in it to dump the rubbish in. So um, we're, we're doing field work where, where we can to record, um, often to record archaeology as it's being destroyed. Um, we did make the information available to sort of our authorities and archaeologists. And um, so for example, this is a Moroccan archaeologist Yusuf Botbot here. Um, that's also David Matany there telling off a guy um, nicking stones, so he's all like that, and they're kind of telling him off nicking stones from a top of a hilltop um, medieval site. So, um, okay, just to finish up then, um, we're using a remote sensing to identify sites and to identify threats. We don't need to be too pessimistic about it. It's not just the only way to record our future when we can't get asked to do field work or whatever. Um, it's also a way of perhaps being more objective and mapping all types of sites, and also then we can provide open source data to archaeologists working throughout the MENA region as well. Um, and the database is set up so that um, information from future field work and survey can sort of be incorporated into that. Thanks very much.